Hello, Alyssa. So, uh, to begin again, I'm Dr. Guy Cappuccino, and today I'm going to be discussing with you the mommy makeover, which is a very common procedure, as uh, you probably already know, and hopefully we can answer all the questions that you have. Please, as we go along in real time, just ask me the questions, and I will um, answer them as I can. So, uh, we begin. Um, what is a mommy makeover? I guess that would seem to be an obvious question. However, it's not an obvious question because it's not one specific procedure. If people say um, rhinoplasty or nose job, we know specifically what we're talking about. We're talking about cosmetic surgery of the nose. However, if we're talking about a mommy makeover, it could be a number of procedures. So it's typically a combination of surgical procedures with the goal of restoring your pre-pregnancy body, or it could be for other reasons like um, you know, significant weight loss or trauma. Um, however, most often it's termed a mommy makeover because it's uh, undoing the um, untoward effects of pregnancy. Hello, Shauna. And for those of you just joining, we just got started, and if you have any questions, just put them in the comments. So most often the mommy makeover is going to discuss um, treatments of the breast and abdomen, typically the torso, but it can be other areas. In fact, it can be any part of the body. Um, pregnancy has some wide-ranging effects. But for the purposes of this discussion today, we're going to keep it to the scope of uh, the typical understanding, which is breast and body. All right, so next thing we're going to do is get my big head out of the way here so you guys can see what I have prepared. So why mommy makeover? As we said, unwanted effects of pregnancy. Um, let's talk about the changes in the breast a little bit because I think there are some misconceptions about the changes in the breast. Um, one of the most misunderstood concepts about pregnancy and breastfeeding is that um, breast changes have occurred because somebody breastfed and often patients will come in and say, well, you know, I, I just wanted the best for my child so I breastfed and this happened to me. Well, listen, I have good news for all of you moms out there that have breastfed. It really has very little to do with breastfeeding and people should breastfeed and um, the positive benefits of breastfeeding are well understood in science. So please continue to breastfeed your children uh, and don't be afraid it's gonna destroy your breasts. However, there are changes that occur and they occur as a result of pregnancy uh, and would occur pretty much regardless of whether or not women go on to continue to breastfeed. Um, so, if we look at this little cartoon here, and I hope this cartoon doesn't get me in Facebook jail, because I know how sensitive they are to the female form when uh, I'm talking about it apparently. Uh, yes, I was put in Facebook jail, but I'm out, as you can see. So, I digress. Let's go back here. So, uh, before pregnancy, this little diagram over here is just showing, uh, I intentionally had this pretty rough cartoon in here, because I think it, it does a pretty good job of explaining some of the architecture of the breast. So during, preg during pregnancy, the breast tissue obviously grows. The gland, the mammary glands, are going to hypertrophy or grow and get ready to produce milk for breastfeeding. And uh, along with this, of course, the breast tissue is going to stretch out. And these ligaments, which you may not even know that you had, but there are ligaments in your breast, and they're called Cooper's ligaments. And they're suspensory ligaments. They hold the breast up in a youthful position. So everything has to stretch during pregnancy and lactation. But after pregnancy, what happens is the volume is lost as that gland shrinks as we conclude lactating. And this is the strange thing. The gland itself actually changes into fat to some extent. So the larger proportion of thick, hard, firm glandular tissue that the youthful breast has gets replaced to a higher proportion of fat. So that fat and gland ratio change. And at the same time, the skin has been stretched out and doesn't have enough recoil to come back to its initial position. And also the Cooper's ligaments are stretched out. So what we often will say is the skin envelope, the covering of the breast, is too large for the breast volume, the filling of the breast. And this gives a very characteristic shape that um, so many women come in and describe to me and they'll call it like a ski slope or a hollowed upper pole or a droop or there's a lot of very unflattering names. Uh, however humorous, and you can feel free to type them in the comments to make me laugh if it's one I've never heard. Um, I'll certainly share it with everybody. 
Um, but in essence, you do have that hollowing of the upper pole. And so this is very typical change of the breast after pregnancy. Okay. Now, uh, let's switch down to abdomen for a minute. And um, what I want you to see on the left is a normal abdominal wall here. The muscle shown in red is the rectus abdominis muscle, um, our so-called six-pack muscles. And as you might imagine, as we continue through pregnancy, the abdomen has to expand. And those muscles, of course, stretch out, but they also separate. You can see that on the right side. And so after pregnancy, those muscles remain separated. And that's what people refer to as a rectus diastasis. A lot of my patients are coming in very well educated uh, from the internet, and they will talk to me about their rectus diastasis, and that's great, and, and that's correct. And so the problem is that the tissue that connects those two muscles in the middle, it's fairly inelastic. And once it is stretched, it's really not going to come back together on its own without surgical intervention. And so that's part of what a tummy tuck does, and we'll get to that. Some other changes. Uh, often there will be a little bit of loose skin. Um, you know, after things shrink back, often the skin is not as elastic as it once was, and there'll be some excess skin. And this gets worse with successive pregnancies. Um, it's not always linear. Sometimes it happens more after a third or a fourth pregnancy, but it can happen after one for people. And then finally, stubborn areas of fat will often remain. I find patients have stubborn areas that you just can't get rid of after pregnancy. So those are the changes in the um, abdominal wall and the breast. Any questions before we move on from anybody about the pregnancy-induced changes of the abdomen and the breast? No? Okay, we'll move on. So then what is a mommy makeover? So uh, a mommy makeover as, or a breast is any combination of the following, a breast lift or a mastopexy, which is going to reshape the skin envelope and have an appropriate amount of skin and shape for the amount of breast tissue we have. So that's a lift. Lifts the breast, also can change the size and shape of the nipple areolar or complex to be more cosmetically appealing. A breast reduction, which is a lift, but we also remove some tissue in case breasts are just too large for the frame. And a breast augmentation or implants, which of course is going to add volume and shape at the same time. And finally, I'm going to mention fat transfer or fat grafting because people do ask me about it. And here's the very short answer with fat grafting. Fat grafting is a good technique to add volume and a little bit of shape to the breast. However, it really is only good for about a half cup size in volume increase. And it won't do a very good job at adding firmness or upper pole fullness. So it's not a fantastic option for restoration of breast volume following breastfeeding. Um, hello, Annette. Thanks for saying hi. And um, any questions about the mind makeover? For those just joining, just uh, fire away. Okay, so that's breast. And the important thing to remember about this list of procedures is the combination. Often I'm doing um, a lift with implants. Sometimes I'm doing a lift, a reduction, and implants. We want to reduce the overall size of the breast, but we want more volume distributed up top. So we can do combinations. When it comes to um, body, it's any combination of the following. A tummy tuck, which is an abdominoplasty, of course. Liposuction, which we're familiar with. And often an umbilical hernia repair, which we see um, goes undiagnosed many times in pregnancies. People don't even know they have them, or they just think they have an Audi when they used to have an innie, and um, I'll repair those at the same time. Okay, so let's get to some examples, because everybody loves before and afters, and I'm going to walk through these patients a little bit and discuss what was done and help understand what, um, you know, what, what the options are. So uh, on the left is the before, of course, and then on the right is the after. As you can see, it says before here, and then um, I'll give you the time out after the procedure. And I've tried to take several different examples of different body types, as well as different time periods postoperatively, so you can see the process. So this is one year after the mommy makeover. And on the right side here, we're going to talk about the list of procedures. And uh, if this were more interactive, <clears throat> I would have people guess. So if anybody would like to, to you know, guess the things that are done, by all means, to you know, jump in there. But I'm just going to kind of list them. And working from the top down, um, literally, not figuratively. So we have breast implants. And I think that's pretty obvious to see because 
the giveaway here is that this hollowed upper pole is now more rounded and pronounced and full. So the only way we're really ever going to get that without a bra um, are breast implants. And we've done a lift. The dead giveaway with the lift is really the nipple position and the height of the breast on the chest wall. And since I can't show nipples on Facebook Live, um, even though it's medical presentation, I have replaced it with this nice badge. Here's my shameless advertising. And for those of you that can't read it, it says, Real Self, Top 100. Yes, I'm Top 100. Guy Cappuccino, MD, Board Certified Plastic Surgeon, Hall of Fame. So I'm so proud of that. I'm so proud that I'm going to cover all my nipples up with it from now on because it happens to be circular and uh, that's pretty awesome. Hey, Cheryl, thanks for joining. So we have a lift. And what you can see here is a vertical scar underneath the areolar complex, and it's well healed at one year. There's also an incision underneath, also well healed and very difficult to see. So when people talk to me about uh, getting a lift, um, you know, they're often very concerned, and understandably so, about scarring. But I have so many before and afters to show people that the scars do fade. And as with a lot of surgeries, we're trading some scars which will fade for optimal shape and I can't control that shape without making those incisions and, and taking skin out. So there we have breast implants and a breast lift. And then pretty obviously we, we have a tummy tuck here and liposuction of the abdomen and waist. So I'll talk a little bit about those procedures at this point. Um, belly button well healed. It's her belly button but the skin has been pulled down and up as well. So here's a good way to see that. Uh, this young lady has some moles. She has this one darker mole right there and you can see it was once there and is now right above her belly button. And these three little freckles are now all the way down here. And that just gives you some idea of how much skin has been pulled down. However, skin also gets pulled up. So the upper pubic skin that's usually loose after pregnancy, that gets pulled up so it's very tight all the way up and down the torso. Um, you can see the skin that had overhung the hips and the waist area is now tight and, and more harmonious with the overall body shape. That talks about the skin envelope. Now let's talk about um, the fat. So that's pretty obvious. You can see that the mid-abdomen here and the waist or love handles area um, was much fuller preoperatively and postoperatively is much more trim and compact. Oh, hi Kim. My reduction lift was the best thing I ever did. Oh, that means so much to me. I can't even tell you. Um, thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, I'm super happy for you as well. So back to our patient here. So that's the liposuction. You can see that. And then finally, the muscles. Remember we talked about that diastasis, the rectus diastasis in the middle. Now, of course, you don't have x-ray vision, neither do I, but I'll give you a little hint. If you look at the outside edge of the muscle, and just have to imagine that there's a convex curvature, it's bowing outwards there and here. It may look like skin and fat, and it is, but it's also the muscles being spread out. Now, as I have brought them back together in the midline, you're going to see on the after picture that the edge of the muscle is almost concave. It bows inwards. And if you just kind of take a look at those pictures back and forth, now you can kind of see it. So not only does that improve the position of the rectus muscles, but it also tightens the abdominal wall, both from the front view but also from the side view. It brings our belly flatter. And of course, we all suck in. I mean, it's just like a natural human reaction. You know, we breathe and we swallow and we suck in, especially when anyone's looking or if there's a mirror. Um, however, now, when we're not sucking in, things are going to be in a much better position. The abdominal wall, the core is going to be in a more youthful, anatomic, natural position, so it's going to be stronger, and it's also going to bring our waist in to give us a little more of an hourglass. So this is a nice, typical mommy makeover, including a breast if lift, a breast implant, a liposuction, tummy tuck, uh, sort of the works. Um, all right, we'll move on. I'm going to show you a couple other examples. So um, here's another younger patient and a uh, totally lovely young lady who I actually saw today. This was a few years ago and we were joking about um, how I wasn't going to slip and say her name online and so I won't. Um, but it actually totally brightened my afternoon to see her and um, 
just a wonderful person to see back in the office. Uh, but this was a few years ago after she had had two children and we did something a little different and that's why I want to share this, this example. So again, list of procedures, you're going to notice uh, breast implants. We have that nice fuller upper pole and my real self pasties are north. So we've done a lift. You can see that. You can also see that the, the breasts are now closer to one another. People often ask me about cleavage. Um, I don't really change the cleavage. I'm not bringing the breast actually closer together, but they have the appearance of being closer together. They certainly don't sit as wide. That's, that's for sure. But now as we move down to the abdomen, I've done something a little different with her. If we look at her preoperatively, she does have a little more fullness than she'd like. And part of that is because the muscles are separated. She has a little extra skin down here and she has some extra fat, um, but she really didn't want to have a full abdominoplasty. And um, I really didn't think that she needed it. So this is a mini tummy tuck. And a mini tummy tuck is a really tricky term because it, like mommy makeover, it does not refer to one procedure, but a variation of a number of procedures that don't encompass all the parts of a full tummy tuck. So if I said mini tummy tuck, um, you wouldn't know exactly what I was talking about. And so I'll just explain what I did, but it's a variation that usually involves shorter incisions, less operating, um, and we tailor it to the person. So what I want you to also notice, this is only three months after the surgery. So um, her incisions are still pink. You can see them as opposed to the last patient that they were very mature and they were hard to see but it's a slightly shorter incision. There's no incision around her belly button. And essentially what we did is we went underneath the skin, we tightened the muscle, we removed some skin, but not all of it. We didn't pull all that skin down because she didn't have all that skin to be pulled down. And we did some liposuction, which you can see in the hip and waist area, as well as the mid abdomen. So um, this is, this is a, a, another variation of a mommy makeover, but I think I think the important thing to understand is the range of procedures and also that everybody is an individual. And as you're going to see a couple more examples, um, it's my job to help you understand what different procedures will give you, what the best outcomes will be, and um, that there isn't one size fits all. Okay, um, another patient, I'm going to move a little more quickly now because there's going to be some repetition. Uh, but again, breast implants, you can see that, breast lift, we can see that. Um, at six months, you can see the scars are there, but they're fading, not quite as faded as one year, but certainly less pink than at uh, three months. And then a full tummy tuck with liposuction. So um, this lady, even at six months, has fantastic abdominal definition. If you look closely, you can start to see her six pack definition coming in. The belly button's healing nicely. Um, I like to step back and kind of look at the body shape in its entirety. Um, and this is just a more youthful, athletic look. Um, Three-quarter view, we can start to look at some three-quarter views as well. And what you're really gonna see here um, in the abdominal wall in the midsection is things are flatter and tighter. And when we take these pictures, we ask people not to suck in and um, to try to have the same pre and post-operative stance so that we can really give you an objective finding. And these are, um, unretouched. It's just how they are at, at six months. You can see her incision is pink, but still there. Um, but in general, there's a much nicer hourglass here. The breasts aren't going to fall back into the armpit. They're going to sit up on the chest wall. And then from the side view, um, well, yeah, I mean, that's just a, a different tail here. Um, we know we have the excess skin and abdominal wall laxity and a little bit of breast drooping. And here, um, these are higher profile implants, meaning they sit higher um, and further out on the chest wall, which is patient preference. We don't have to do that. We can sort of tailor that to what the patient wants the shape to look like, um, but you can see you know, quite a different contour there. Yeah, here's a, a, a very different patient from the, the prior few that we looked at, but I, I like to give you a, a variation. So um, again, this is a very thin, younger mom who's had children, obviously, um, and well, I say obviously only because we're talking about mommy makeover and I said she's a mom because you wouldn't look at her and think that she's had children necessarily because she's so physically fit and so thin. Um, however, she wanted to restore some volume in the breast. So we wanted this upper pole to be a little more full. So we just did implants here. There's no lift, as you can tell. There's no need for a lift. When it comes to her abdomen, there are a couple things that you'll notice. First of all, you see the protruding belly button. Well, that's your umbilical hernia, so we repaired that. 
And if you look closely, because she's so thin, you can see that the outer edge or the lateral edge of the rectus muscle is bowed out a little bit. And actually, if you look carefully, you can even see this inner rift between the two, this separation of the muscles. And so this is a variation of a tummy tuck, but unlike the last patient, there was no liposuction involved. There was almost no skin removal involved, although she did have a C-section scar that wasn't the best, so we revised it. But I just used that C-section incision to go in, tie the muscles back together, fix the umbilical hernia, and then uh, close the incision. So if you look left to right, her waist is going to be a little tighter. It's certainly going to be flatter um, in terms of core strength. It will be better, more functional. Um, and overall, harmony of the upper and lower torso is more to her liking. So this is a good example of a mommy makeover, but very different look than the other two procedures, or few procedures. Sean, a question, yes. Thank you, I love to interact. After a tummy tuck, how long until you can work out? Oh, great question. I was actually gonna just get to this, so let's talk about it a little bit. So regardless of the extent of the tummy tuck, if we are tightening the muscles, which is integral to almost all tummy tucks, um, I don't want people to do strenuous workouts, meaning core isolation exercises, till about six weeks. But for most people, the exercise regimen looks like this. By about two weeks, I like people to do at least some light aerobics, as little as a brisk walk to get your heart rate up, um, as much as almost even a jog or a light elliptical or a treadmill. By three to four weeks, I let people do more aggressive aerobics, some resistance weights, especially at their upper extremities or lower extremities. I just don't allow people to do resistance exercises of the core yet. So no push-ups, planks, burpees, squat thrusts, crazy stuff like flipping tires. Um, so none of that until we get out to six weeks. But it's a progressive uh, pattern, and I really like people to get back to activity as fast as possible, both from the psychological benefit of it, but also um, increasing blood flow and overall well-being of the body to aid in healing. So it's that fine balance, and we help you walk through it, but hopefully that answers your question. All right, this will be, I think, our last example today. Um, and it's a juxtaposition from the prior patient who is very thin, very fit, um, and had had children and just needed some tightening and augmentation. And this patient kind of needs the, the works as well as the first few patients. Um, but since it's a very different body shape, I just wanted to share with you. And so as with the prior patients, you can see um, that we've added volume to the upper breast. We have removed extra skin and given the breast a nicer, rounder, more uh, youthful appearing shape. This is a year out, so my incisions are gonna be well healed. Abdominal surgery, again, there's a tummy tuck incision, which to me, I would call this one almost an extended abdominoplasty, which means I've just extended the incision out almost as far posterior as I can without turning the patient on their belly during the surgery. And that allows me to lift the posterior hips and even the, the um, lateral buttocks up a little bit. You'll see that the pubic tissue is much thinner and tighter. So there's a smooth line from the upper thigh through the pubic region up into the abdomen. The abdominal wall looks very different. Um, you know, it's just a different shape entirely because we've removed skin and fat and tightened muscle. So this is sort of the other end of the spectrum. You're welcome, Shauna. I hope that answered your question fully. All right, so um, to end this, I, I thought I would just be very straightforward and give some time, cost, and recovery. We talked a little bit about tummy tuck recovery, so I can skip that to some extent. Um, I'm going to give you some averages for my practice in terms of cost. Obviously, it's a range because everybody's a little different, but I'd like to just try to answer questions that I would want to know, um, and, and none of this is a secret. You can call my office, and they're very well informed. They can give you a range of prices on specific procedures and times, but uh, since we're here, let's, let's try to get some of this out. Kim, are there any concerns with illness related to implants? I've seen some new lately highlighting stars that have needed to remove them. Oh, yeah. Um, Sure, actually this is a good time to talk about it, Kim. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that here. Um, let me get through this slide and then we'll, we'll get to that. So just for implants, when I'm putting, giving you times here, they are just as if we were going into the OR to do one procedure, meaning come into the operating room, go to sleep, prep the patient, do the surgery, wake up and leave. If we're combining procedures, that time gets cut down. It's not entirely additive because it's only one time in the OR and one time out. And, um, and also sometimes the cost goes down because of that because our time is going to be lower so the OR and anesthesia time goes down. 
cost so approximately sixty five hundred dollars that includes implants and surgical fees and anesthesia fees and OR fees and facility fees and medication fees and garments and everything. So I'm trying to give people an all in. This is for the highest um, cost current silicone gel implants. There are a variation of cost implants. This could be as much as a thousand dollars or even more less depending on the type of implants we use, but I really kind of want to um, give a very typical example because I like to use those implants. And recovery. So with breast implants, you know, you can be back to work in a day or two for most jobs and easy aerobics in a couple of weeks. I just avoid heavy workouts of the chest for about six weeks. Um, Kim, we really should do an entire talk about breast implants at some point in the future. But since you asked, I'm just going to give you a, a very short synopsis. Um, you're the the term that we are currently hearing in the media is breast implant illness. Um, I speak for myself and not all plastic surgeons and not all patients in this, but this is my take on it. Breast implant illness as defined by the FDA um, is an ill-defined constellation of unrelated physical symptoms that may or may not be related to breast implants and may or may not improve when breast implants are removed. Typically those are things like um, muscle aches, fatigue, brain fog, memory loss, you know, loss of energy, basically everything that you get once you turn 40 and have kids. And I don't mean that facetiously. I have almost every one of those things every single day. Um, it's just part of getting older. Now, can I prove with 100% certainty that this is the case for every patient? No, there may actually be patients who have some biological interaction. However, it is my professional and personal opinion that in the majority of these cases, it is psychosomatic. Now, please understand when I say that, I don't mean that people are psycho because it's a psychosomatic. What I mean is if you believe that uh, a physical manifestation will occur, you believe it, you actually can make it occur. Our, our minds are incredibly powerful. And with every breast implant discussion, I talk about this in detail with patients. And I say, this is what is out there. The media is highlighting it because well, it's been a little slower in the media since COVID's winding down, so it's always a good time to beat up on breast implants. It's an easy target. We've been doing this for about 40 years now, and every decade it takes a different name. Um, and medical science continually proves that there's no correlation between implants and illness. However, we'll never separate the fact that people will have these ailments and people will believe that they're related to implants. So very, very long story short is it is real. If you believe it is real, it is 100% real. Um, if you have any concerns about them, you should not get implants. If you have no concerns about them, then neither do I. Uh, I have no problem recommending them to patients, friends, family um, with that caveat. So I hope that answers the question. And uh, anybody who disagrees with me is welcome to disagree with me. And until scientific evidence really meets out a, a definitive answer, um, I think my opinion is better than most, being that I've done thousands and thousands of these. So. Okay, uh, time cost and recovery for breast lift and reduction. So breast lift and reduction typically takes about three hours and about $8,000, again, inclusive of OR anesthesia, surgical fees, supplies, and so on and so forth. And recovery, um, three to four days for most people to get back to light work. I don't have drainage tubes. This is not a difficult, awful thing. Um, easy aerobics in two weeks and full workout in six weeks. So that's, that's breast implant or uh, breast lift and reduction. Uh, or if they were breast implant and reduction. So it doesn't change the cost much. Let me just say that. If we were adding implants, it wouldn't change the cost much. Um, and if we were doing a breast lift and a reduction and implants, um, a lot of the work is in the lift process. So I hope, hope that makes sense. We're already there, so it's not that much extra work to put the implants in. It's really just the cost of the implants. Uh, time and cost recovery for liposuction. Well, of course, this is variable because we could be doing a very small area just around the belly or maybe we could be doing the hips and the waist or flanks or bra roll or outer thighs or inner thighs. I mean, we could go on forever. So it's a very wide range. Between really four and 6,000 covers most of it and compression is what's gonna be needed afterwards. And although there's no muscle involved, I do like people to ease back into workouts. But after about two weeks, people can get back to pretty normal exercise and full workout at four weeks. Finally, a tummy tuck with lipo. This is most typically what I wind up doing because almost everybody, almost everybody who gets a tummy tuck also needs some liposuction. It's also about three hours and the cost is between nine and 10,000, again, inclusive of everything. 
and that varies. It could be less than that if we're not doing lipo. And back to work in three to four days for light work. Um, this is for lipo. If we're talking about the tummy tuck, it's going to be back to work in more like 10 days. All right, so um, I just want to make sure that we understand that. If we're doing the lipo alone three to four days, if we're doing the tummy tuck with it, more like seven to 10 days. If we're doing heavy work, um, heavy lifting and, and really physically laborious jobs, more like two weeks. And full workout in six weeks as we discussed earlier. And that brings us to the end of our procedure, uh, our discussion rather today. Um, Tammy, let's see. Do they go together, lift and reduction, or is it only one or the other? Oh, see, I answered that. Yeah, so um, lift, reduction, implants, it could be one or all of them. And of course, they're, they're done together. I shouldn't say of course, I like to do them together. Um, I like to minimize people's trips to the OR if I can, although not everybody advises doing them together. However, that's the way I've always done them and it works out pretty well. So in conclusion, thank you very much everybody for joining me today. If you liked this presentation, um, please feel free to share it with other people who you think might be interested in it. And we do monitor the comments sections. We try to answer as quickly as we can, even after the presentation. It should go live on our Facebook page and then we'll be on our website as well. So this information will be out there in the public domain to refer to in the future. And as always, thank you very much for joining me and I'll see you next month.